much business. Okay, folks, gather up here for uh, our next panel, which is focused on new, new space programs. Um, and uh, the people are on. We're going to follow the list, just as it is on the agenda. And uh, so up first is Darlene Dam talking about Open Space University. Darlene. Thank you. Um, so my understanding of what this portion of uh, the morning is about is sort of where are, are all, where are we going with all of this? And I think we're at an interesting point in time because in the past, uh, and you know, when Ed yesterday he talked about there's a lot of different definitions of citizen science right now. And I think in the past when we, we use that, we thought of um, sort of hobbyists or educational outreach. But because of what the access to technology that we have today, I think we're at a time where citizen science, as you know, as um, Jim Caraballo was speaking about, it, everything that's happening in this room could be turned into a new company and be part of the new future industry. So we're at this transition point. And, um, and DIY rockets, so we're a global space company. We, our, our vision is to be a, a big space company, just like any other, but we're open source and we are working with people in new ways through crowdsourcing. So we hope to have the same impact as a global space company, but we will just be operating differently and the, the value that comes from that company will be distributed differently to the people involved. And it were the whole process from, you know, from R&D to the, the products that we build, it's, it's open source, it's crowdsourced, and that changes everything. Um, and then uh, just to, 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 to think about why is that possible right now? Like one thing that has happened is stuff that used to be physical is now digital. So um, we see that both in the design process and how you know, Sunglass yesterday was talking about collaborative design. And we see that with um, 3D printing. So manufacturing is now also digital. And when things are digital, it means that everybody can participate in it if you have an internet connection. And that it also follows um, Moore's Law. And we have Emmeline, who's back there from the Singularity University, who's uh, an expert in that, in which um, I was a part of and helped uh, inspire this. So, okay, so what is DIY Rockets? So there's two things that we're doing right now. We're um, crowdsourcing and open sourcing space, the design of space technology, and also knowledge. And uh, if you go to, well, actually, we'll start here. So we, we incorporated in October, and we launched our first competition in uh, March. And our competition, in, in partnership with Sunglass, is calling for the designs of uh, 3D printed rocket engines um, that, could, uh, that could carry a nanosat of uh, 10 kilograms or less into space. And we, we left this very, very broad because we're working with a lot of new technology. We're working with 3D printing, we're working um, with collaborative design over the internet. So basically we said, this is the goal, you know, think about how you could do this with, uh, you know, taking in, into account other systems, other types of uh, space vehicles, stages, different things. We're not gonna tell you all that, we just want you to try and see what you can come up with. So um, we launched this in March and we had uh, 90 teams register. This really surprised us because we had no idea if this was going to work and everyone was saying it won't work and it's crazy. And um, out of that, we've had 10 teams that have gone on to the second phase. And the, the competition is in phases because the purpose is, it, it, a big focus of it is collaboration, which means that you don't want to have a contest and then at the end of the time, everyone shares the information. You want them to start sharing it early. So the first phase is uh, drafts of uh, their designs and concept notes explaining um, how it fits. So you can go to our website and see, um, you just, you click on here and the, their engines will come up and you can also click on the concept note and, and, and read about what they're doing. This, it takes a little bit to load. Um, so that's one part. And then the other piece is we created 
I'll, I'll let you guys do that on your computer so I can go here. We also created something called the Open Space University, and this ties into the earlier question too about how do you, you know how does collaboration happen online? How do you um, share what you learn and your knowledge? And the Open Space University is tapping into the online education revolution, which is also digitalization of uh, of education. And um, so, what you know, we're a new company. What we we started with is just pulling together all the resources that exist. So um, we pulled together uh, YouTube videos that are happening in talks, um, you know, that individuals are making alone all around the world. And you know, if you scroll down, you can also see, um, there's tons of tutorials on design, you know, using all different types of, of CAD software. So we, we've just been putting that, pulling it together. And, um, and our plans for this in the future is we're setting up partnerships with different institutions. So where's Sean? Silicon Valley Space Center. So we, um, but we actually have a, a channel where we're recording um, talks that happen here and, um, and, and are streaming it to the website. And this is something you know, that we, we're hoping that we can all build together. If you have something that you think should, should be on here, you can submit it over our website. Um, and let's see. And then, it, yeah, and then so right now what we're working on is, you know, you can see DR, DIY Rockets is homemade right now. We're, you know, just a few months old. So we're working right now on lining up our additional competitions for technology, both to take it, you know, from the design stage to actually building and testing. But also, we're identifying the different pieces of technology that we should be build that will, will make the most difference in the industry. Overall, if um, there are, the cost can be brought down, which is what this is is really about, and what's that infrastructure that needs to be built for the space industry as a whole. So that's it. Thanks. That's really exciting. <laughs> <laughs> I got excited about that. One. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, let's let's have a little time for questions. I'd like to do that actually after each one of these. I think the questions are great. Yes. Have you ever worried about, I don't know, ITAR restrictions or putting the knowledge about how to design rocket engines online for everybody to know? Yeah. So there's two pieces of that. One is like right now, are, you know, are, what, is what we're doing okay? And um, so for ITAR, the, for rocket engines, the, the payload is over 500 kilograms. And there's also, a, you don't need to apply for a license if your information is in the public domain. And that's a big question, what is the public domain? Does it need to be approved beforehand? But what we're doing is we're following uh, DIY drones, which for 2008 has been uh, doing this, open, you know, public open source. And then there's a bigger question though, is this is changing, this is happening in every industry. We were talking about you know, guns, 3D printed guns, and I think where it's gonna go is in addition to our regulations, people are going to be responding um, similar to what happened in you know, biotech with, when the group started monitoring, monitoring itself and you have bioethics right now. So I think we're all, and individuals will be, you know, what we see, it, almost like the immune system of the world, individuals will be helping. Uh, can I ask a quick question? I wonder how many professionals are in the, uh, participating also. Yeah, how many professionals are participating? So, of the 10 teams, you can go onto our community forum and they've introduced themselves. Um, it, it, I don't have all the information about everybody, but I, I think there's, uh, I would say, three professional teams, uh, three universities, uh, and then there's a couple individuals. I don't quite know what their affiliation is. And then within that group, which was really interesting to me, we had. Um, Blackman Road Junior High team, and they, they jumped in and they used Google SketchUp and they've got their design and their concept notes. So it's, this is, the, it's the whole range, it's breaking down barriers between um, who can participate in the space industry, if, if you're 12 or if you're, you know, 90. And it's, it's also, it's about teamwork, right? So I'm really excited what we'll see. Yes, go ahead. Um, yes, this kind of ties in with the last, uh, panel discussion too. Um, it's, it's, 
what about prior art? So, you know, on somebody's shelf there might be some information about rockets or space technology or what have you. Um, and essentially you're gonna reinvent the wheel when it's already existing. How about access to that kind of knowledge of prior art? Do you mean just in terms of people being able to have access to the information or? Well, well, well yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, a lot of what NASA does is, is open to the public. Yeah. Except for right now, it's a little offline. Yeah. Technical report server, but that's another issue altogether. Um, but there, it's not just NASA, but it's other universities. Um, there's peer-reviewed articles yes. um, with results and yes. you know, design specs and things like that. But that's not always easily accessible yeah. um, to, to a regular individual who has an idea, oh, has yeah. this been done before? Has yeah. it been done in microgravity? I yeah. mean, is, is are, are So you that's what the Open Space University is, and oh. we've been going one by one, finding this stuff and extracting it and putting it up, and then we're hoping with partnerships there'll be more. And actually one of our interns in the rocket competition just put on the community forum, let's start a, a space journal to cover all of this and share our research. So, and we can put that out through the Open Space University too. Yeah, one quick comment on that. I mean, I'm, you know, my, my business has been doing a lot of that stuff for years connected with NASA and I'm astounded when I go on Google and, and put almost anything, anybody's name, topic or something, you know, the, the number of times I hit you know, stuff I know nothing about that I presumably am sort of an expert on, right? Or exactly the thing I was looking for, some of the esoteric thing. Right. So, uh, I mean, you know, it's just astounding what you can find. But, but the trick is, of course, is, is, you know, get things out there and present things and so, so they, they show up online. But I think then, you know, finding somebody you want to talk to and being able to drill down and find them uh, is more and more and more and, and getting involved in you know, networks where people know people. I think this is sort of where it's at and where it's going. Yeah, I think this, this type of workshop is very useful. No, it is. Yeah, and, yeah, and just lastly, jo you know, join our website, share your knowledge, um, jo join our forums, help the competition. We can help what, you put, what you're working on there. So. Thank you. Uh, one more question. Jay, why don't you use that mic? Okay. Um, so one one thing about being open source, being a big university or something else, uh, is advanced materials, uh, and it seems like that's a decision in terms of which way you want to go. Because if there's advanced materials, are you finding ways to somehow access that, or ways to work in, around that that still meet your purpose? You mean in terms of does everyone have access to that type of uh, technology? Technology, or are you? Some materials are very exclusive or yeah. proprietary yeah. or secret. Yeah. In some way. Yeah. So, um, it, I'm not quite sure I understand what you're asking, but we're. I mean, that's where cost. Are you? Are you really? I think I can as far as I understand, you're doing it to 3D printed, and 3D printing has their own you know, drawbacks and positive sides. Like for example, making cooling channels is very difficult with 3D printing because the powder will remain there, you cannot shake it off. So they have to be large. If they're large, they're not good at cooling. So um, design of that is exactly like, okay, I have these problems and these advantages. How do I make a rocket engine? How do I make a rocket? So you, you don't have to have access to Inconel, Castelloy, or any kind of advanced materials. You try to to do with what you got. I mean, you can make a rocket engine from aluminum. Um, it's not going to be a very hot one. It will work on, I don't know, alcohol and liquid oxygen, for example. Uh, but you're not, you, you do not have to be in some kind of a special club of people who have access to super materials to build a rocket engine. You can just start do, building one in your garage and it will work if you apply your knowledge. It can be printed too. Just one other thing, shapeways, it, it, they are as the top three winners they're giving credit for them to to print so that so yes yeah okay great okay thank you very much darling uh we're going to shift to jason reimauer who's going to talk about his uh possum program another great name <laughs> here he is okay thank darling for a great presentation and uh, so, my name is Jason Ramuller, and I want to share with you uh, Project Possum. This is a uh, suborbital research campaign, um, a suborbital research project. Uh, the 
the project itself is devoted to uh, studying the ways we affect our, our climate by using uh, reusable suborbital vehicles. Uh, so we're implementing remote sensing techniques uh, on these vehicles. And uh, what we've developed is an aronomy laboratory. So aronomy is a, a term uh, for basically essentially the upper atmosphere and also an observatory uh, that will be able to look at a lot of broader types of uh, earth observing science, aronomy, atmospheric science applications. So this started out uh, initially about a year and a half ago uh, with a, a core team of um, scientists that focused on noctilucent clouds. It's a kind of high altitude cloud I'll talk about in a bit. And we proposed to NASA's Flight Opportunities Program and got some support to, uh, to use a reusable suborbital vehicle to actually fly through a noctilucent cloud. Um, and so this has grown to be the Possum campaign. And Possum itself is a way to expand this opportunity that was based around creating imagery and tomography uh, to really optimizing what we had available in the, in the spacecraft and be able to create a suborbital uh, aronomy laboratory that would be optimized for questions like noctilucent uh, clouds that we hope to kick off here 2014 in, in a uh, high latitude campaign. And then the instruments that we will develop and qualify through this, uh, through these uh, campaigns, we're going to make available to a wide range of scientific applications into a modular interchangeable observatory. So first, let's talk about noctilucent clouds. Uh, two terms, depends if you're looking at it from below or above. Historically, from ground observations, they've been called noctilucent clouds because they appear to glow at night. They're so high up. They're 80, about 83 kilometers by the, by the mesopause region uh, that they still reflect light long after the sun has set. Uh, they've also been termed polar mesospheric clouds by the satellite community. So if you're looking at them from above, and this came about from these reflections very high up uh, that uh, spacecraft have been seeing from this. So these, both of these terms refer to the same thing. It depends if you're looking at the clouds from below or from above. So I guess in a suborbital vehicle, there are not lucent clouds going up and polar mesospheric clouds coming down. Um, so they roughly reside a little bit below the mesopause. They, they believe to nucleate at the mesopause and then they grow uh, pulling in water vapor until they become visible at about 83 kilometers. Below that, it gets too warm and they sublimate. Um, and you can only see them at a particular time. They're, you can see them a little bit after the, uh, the solstice. Time. So uh, it's the only time that that area, the meso uh, mesosphere area, gets cold enough. Uh, it's a little counterintuitive. Um, but you see them um, you know, from about the solstice to about a month, month and a half after the solstice. And, uh, so they, and they're believed to form out of, out of wa water vapor this time of year. So a few kinds of clouds that we've seen from the ground. Uh, the community terms them bands and billows, depending on the wave structures. These features are believed to be uh, caused by uh, gravity waves. Uh, these, are, these are waves that are excited in the lower atmosphere by, say, mountains or, or, or convection, and they expand upwards, and then they break, much like a wave would break on the shore, and deposit their energy in the upper atmosphere. So the upper atmosphere is, uh, is such an interesting part, uh, such a vital part to understand, because we know so so little of it, but it's the most sensitive part of our planet. So if we want to really understand how, our, how we're affecting our planet as a whole, this is the place that we want, want to see it, because very small changes that we make here reflect themselves in very large patterns of observables in the upper atmosphere. So these are important because uh, of these, uh, as, as this proxy of the way we're reflecting it, it's the, also the, uh, the connection with the, the solar environment. Um, historically, we first noticed these clouds in 1885. It was believed from the Krakatoa explosion that forced these aerosols into the sky. But uh, we've been noticing them, especially over the last four or five decades, that they've been in increasing in brightness. They've been coming to lower latitudes, and we've been seeing them with more frequency. So we asked ourselves, why is that? Why could that be? Well, we know clouds, they need water vapor, and they need cold temperatures relative to the dew point to form. Well, we think about this, and we think about the, the, uh, what's causing this, the two major drivers of the, the man-made uh, drivers of climate change are carbon dioxide and methane. Well, carbon dioxide in the mesosphere acts as a net cooling agent. Methane photodisassociates to water vapor. 
Uh, so we think that these are the, the main drivers, that these could be indicative of the way we're affecting the, the climate down here below. Um, they're also of interest for um, operationally for reentry vehicles. You know, NASA has historically not reentered the space shuttle through uh, visible noctilucent cloud, uh, not because it wouldn't do anything bad, we just don't know enough about it to really surely say it would be safe to do so. When you're coming back at Mach 25, you know, who knows how big the particles might be. Um, and they're also a good proxy for understanding other worlds, say Mars, you know, somewhere where you have, you know, a, 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 a very uh, low density clouds, low density atmosphere. Uh, so the more we can understand our mesosphere, the more we can understand areas like that. So we've observed these from the, the ground uh, through ground observations. LIDAR systems uh, have given us a, a limited velocity profile or limited vertical structures as well. Uh, space space observations, most notably the AIM satellite, that's the Aronomy of Ice in the Mesosphere, is a uh, explorer um, a NASA satellite that's specifically dedicated to studying these clouds, and it's given us some great information. There's three major payloads on it. That image up top is SIPS. It's an imager that looks, uh, it uh, uses the UV background. It's a UV imager that uh, is able to um, image these clouds from orbits and, and be able to infer particle size from that. Sounding rockets have given us a little bit of information in situ. Airborne observations, this is my own personal dissertation. Uh, it's a little bit of my, I'll plug my own dissertation there. It flew a, a small plane up to North Canada to synchronize with a, 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 the AIM overpass and was able to get information that helped the, uh, the AIM team be able to mature their uh, processing algorithms. And it can give us a little more of the temporal evolution of the clouds too. But there's gaps, you know, every little bit of these applications gives us a little bit of piece of the puzzle. And it's understanding this, this larger phenomenon. But now we have this new capability with reusable suborbital vehicles. So we really want to use this as an opportunity to be able to use this capability in ways that haven't been available to us before to get a broader, more comprehensive understanding of these clouds and what they mean. So we applied to NASA. This was the Nucleus and Cloud Imagery and Tomography Experiment that was accepted last year. Um, the major objective of this was to fly a video still frame camera and an infrared camera and we were to look uh, at the get, get high resolution imagery that we could get the small scale structures of. What that can help us do is really help us understand what the motion dynamics and especially what the uh, coupling is, how energy and momentum are carried up from the lower atmosphere and deposited in the upper, upper atmosphere and that will ultimately help us uh, test more of that hypothesis of that, that link with the uh, drivers of, of uh, climate change below. But they're poorly understood. We just haven't had good means to do this. There is this area that is too high to get to by, uh, by aircraft, by balloons, too low to get to by satellites. It's been very inaccessible. The sounding rockets have only given us limited and very costly data as well. A lot of sounding rocket campaigns are making unique instruments and, and recovering the rockets after we fly them. So um, the, the, again, these are the uh, objectives. This is an example of uh, one of our team members that has a, uh, <coughs> that, that develops a tomography, looking at, based on the assumptions of how we've been to observe these previously, uh, we can see how energy, the, the red is the areas of higher energy, and we see areas that represent band structures, and these little curls in the upper top could form billow structures. But, you know, these models are only as good as the inputs that you can put into them, and the inputs are only as good as the observables that you can get. So we hope to, uh, to improve these uh, observables. This is another model of that showing the formations at different altitudes and how the higher altitudes you see more below the structures popping out of the band structures as well. Uh, so a lot of advantages here than we've had with uh, suborbital, uh, w than, than we've had available <coughs> to us from sounding rockets. You know, we have a stabilized platform that can give us uh, early improved imagery. We can fly a, a vehicle like the Lynx in two hours that can help us address uh, changes in evolution within the period of even one night, um, let alone interseasonally. In sounding rocket campaigns, you might get one flight out of the whole season. Well, we can do this repeated within a night observation, within a, a season of a, a month observation, and, and year to year in a very cost-effective way. Um, having a, a, a manned operator aboard We'll be able to specifically look at the microfeatures that killed in Helmholtz instabilities, the ways they're deposited, um, <clears throat> being able to pick out exactly what's of greatest scientific interest, reducing the overall mission risk 
as well by being able to monitor the systems, refine the settings of the camera, optimize things uh, accordingly to, um, uh, to uh, the, the signal in the background that we would expect to see. So this is a ball. We realized that we have this, this project that, that NASA supported us with, and we, uh, we realized that there was a lot of opportunity too. We had uh, three flights that we had uh, proposed, um, but we wanted to really bring back as much as we could from a scientific standpoint. We wanted to optimize the science. And furthermore, we proposed a weak deployment. Uh, from our own exper experience, we can't predict when these clouds are gonna show. So the best we could do is go up and wait. Well, there's a lot of opportunity there. A lot of time the vehicle may not fly. So this is, a, this is an opportunity cost that we want to, to optimize on days that we see clouds and days that we don't. We want to bring in an integrated science campaign that will bring the most value back in terms of technology maturation and science um, back to NASA, back to, this, to uh, the community as a whole. So <clears throat> we want to optimize the, the space available each mission, optimize the missions available during the campaign, and, uh, and bring back the most we can. So scientifically, we want to continue. We're going to get the small scale dynamics, but now we have uh, complementary payloads that would optimize themselves in the space uh, and weight power available that we would have in a vehicle such as the Lynx. Um, we'd be look, able to look now at the seasonal variabilities. We'd be able to look at how these, these small scale structures, the energy and momentum may change within the period of a singular observation. With the infrared camera, we're going to be able to look at uh, OH layers, you know, different layers within air glow and see how they're coupled and, and look at more of the vertical structures, ways that LIDAR has never been able to, to give us before. <coughs> we're going to be able to uh, repeatedly send um, mass detectors, uh, aerosol detectors to, to really get uh, a better understanding on, on perhaps how these nucleate. This is one uh, payload that hasn't uh, quite given us the data we want to on the AIM satellite, but that's also looking at it from an altitude 300 or 500 kilometers above these, where we'll be able to actually go through these. So we hope we'll be able to address this question more thoroughly. We'll have a LIDAR system uh, developed at the University of Colorado, and this uh, will help us look at the, the sphericity of the particles. Uh, this is something we don't know, and we can only get from that kind of geometry, and that's going to help us refine our thermodynamical models so we can understand more how much of these, these carbon dioxide and how much of uh, these methane may be contributing to the formation and, uh, of what we observe as noxious cloud strata. And in doing this, we're going to repeat a way that uh, a method, an observatory that we're going to be able to repeat cost effectively, season to season, and understand the longer term trends of these clouds and be able to validate um, equipment that can be applied in a much broader, uh, much broader way. So uh, Deuteronomy Laboratory here, we've got Possum Cam. The uh, initial payload is going to be operator controlled in the front of a uh, vehicle, uh, such as the Lynx, and a video camera, still frame camera, uh, an infrared camera. And there's a uh, proposed A-band spectrometer that's going to look at uh, temperature, spatially resolved temperatures um, remotely. We'll have a LiDAR that's going to be able to uh, look at the sphericity of the particles. <laughs> And uh, the pods that we have made available to us, we have several options, uh, ranging from the mass uh, aerosol uh, spectrometer, as well as payload that can look at the pressures uh, and ultimately the temperatures and possibly even the winds through a variety of techniques from falling spheres to, um, uh, to uh, other emissions that can really characterize the mesosphere at the same time that we are imaging, that we're getting data from the observables. And technologically, this is going to validate a, a way that we're going to be able to um, build an observatory. We're going to have space rated uh, payloads that are going to be modular, interchangeable. We're going to be able to apply this to, uh, to a vehicle like the Lynx can go anywhere in the world. Uh, technically, you just need a 7,500 foot runway and the permissions to launch it. Um, so anything you have a mesoscale uh, mesos area of climate, uh, area of interest in climate, could be agronomy, uh, could be atmospheric science, or it could be terrestrial observation from anything to agronomy to, to um, um, oceanography, to forestry, to um, glaciology. Uh, all of these are particular applications that we could do uh, using this. So uh, two phases, we're gonna hope to have a uh, initial test flight here, and then the uh, campaign itself will be a week long. It has to be in July, it's the only time. Uh, so we're shooting for 2014. Um, as a campaign, and the leading candidate would be Karuna, uh, Sweden. It's at a latitude of 68 degrees. 
Um, we would launch when we, ver when we verify through LIDAR or observations that a, that a cloud's visible. And we would uh, launch in a way that would be pointing northward and be able to adjust our pitch accordingly so we'd be able to get the best profile forward scattering uh, across the limb. This is our team. We have a really well-balanced international team um, representing the different sciences and instrument uh, development as well from different universities. Uh, some of our collaborators, including here the uh, Space Center. And ultimately, here's our opportunities. Well, we're, we're building our campaign still, and we want to bring us together. If you have uh, interest, science experiments, uh, you would like to um, talk to me about it. We'd love to try to inter integrate your interests uh, or, your, or, your, um, or possibly requirements for a particular science application onto the observatory. You know, we're still uh, uh, maturing aspects of this, so I'd love to hear about you. And we were also hosting uh, to these goals, we're hosting the Suborbital Researchers Imaging and Remote Sensing Conference in Boulder, Colorado in uh, first week of October. And that's going to uh, bring together a much broader community for the, the experiment that we have. So that's what I have, and let me open this up for questions. You have a projector for the cost for a full-blown possible flight on, on the links, or is that not something you can talk about? Well, in, their individual cost, uh, according to links, is $95,000, and this is an order of magnitude less than a sounding rocket uh, flight. Um, there are logistical expenses that are in our negotiation right now. There are different uh, various different parties that um, have interests and, and funding, um, potentially, so that's under, under negotiation as well. But it's a, Fairly transportable um, uh, uh, structure uh, vehicle as well. And so essentially, you would, you would um, the cost would occupy a whole um, a payload in a passenger seat, right? For, for, for one whole flight, right? Uh, yes, as well as pods and and you know basically it's we've been able to organize a large group of interests and payloads and we've, we've done kind of what we like to term an inverse science traceability matrix. We've taken what we've had, uh, what are our key under answered science questions, and try to bring this around in the most uh, efficient way that we can to bring back the most science. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Jason. Fascinating uh, collaborative study. Um, so now we have John Cumbers who's going to speak about synthetic biology. You know, you can get to these folks after for more questions. Where did the clicker go, Rick? Uh, oh. Uh, where did the clicker go? Oh, this is, we have our clicker. Okay. I want to use this. This, this, is, this button is next slide. Okay, go down. Okay, John, you want to hold this? Sure. Okay, hi everyone. My name is John Cumbers. I work in the Synthetic Biology Program at NASA Ames, and uh, I also uh, advise a bunch of startup companies in synthetic biology, and I'm going to talk mostly about uh, resource utilization in space and why biology is a really important self-replicating technology and one of the most efficient ways to use resources in space if you're constrained by mass, uh, which of course we are. Gravity holds us down. Um, if you read back at some of the writing of John von Neumann, the father of computer science, he advocated self-replicating machines as a way to colonize the moon. And it's some beautiful writing uh, on this idea of self-replication. You could send a very small mass, a robot, and it could not only perform a function, but it could also build another robot. And um, we, uh, I'll, I'll talk about in a second how biology is that self-replicating machine. If you look at just the costs, and normally I play a game with the audience, but we haven't got time. Uh, but if you look at the, uh, the rising costs of, of uh, water, uh, 
if you uh, take it out of the tap, it's uh, 0 0.0008 cents per liter. If you bottle it up, uh, uh, buy it from Costco, about 30 cents a liter. Increasing in costs uh, as you get past Fiji water up to the ISS. Any water that you use on the ISS is about $10,000 uh, a liter because, of course, you've had to send it there. There is no water uh, naturally there. Um, if you want to have water on the moon surface or the Martian surface, it's uh, nearer to $100,000 a liter at the moment. So the importance of uh, resources and the cost of them. And of course, that all depends on your launch technology, and we're all grateful to SpaceX for being able to bring down the cost of resources in space. But it also highlights the need to recycle it, because if we take the lowest estimate for a kilogram of anything in space, which is about $5,000 uh, a kilogram, and then you look at the daily inputs of an astronaut and the daily outputs of an astronaut. Just in the consumption of water, we're talking five liters a day. Multiply that by $5,000, and you have a total cost of $27,000 that it costs you to get that water there for the astronaut. So if you start to think in terms of dollar values, which of course NASA doesn't, doesn't necessarily do all the time, but as people interested in startups and business, that's what you've got to do. It's incredibly expensive to get anything to the space station, um, food in particular. If you look at the outputs of, the, of an astronaut per day, uh, you breathe out one kilogram of CO2 every day. So that means you're breathing out $5,000 of CO2 every day that you're in space. What does NASA, what do NASA do with that on the ISS at the moment? Well, it's converted into water and methane and the methane is just vented out the side of the ISS. So there's incredible inefficiencies in what we're doing at the moment uh, and an incredible need for technology. We're taking up food at $5,000 a kilogram and we're venting it out the side of the ISS as CO2. Um, meaning it's no wonder that the cost of the ISS, 1.5 billion per year, is just on crew and cargo transportation alone. So I see this as a huge market in terms of resources for recycling and in terms of resources for the conversion of CO2 into higher value products. Why biology? If I take a single cell and I put it in a test tube and give it the right conditions and the right media, in just 24 hours that single cell can turn into one billion cells. So that's a huge uh, replication of the technology just inside a very short space of time. And biology is a manufacturing technology. That single cell is capable of producing uh, millions of proteins and, uh, as I said, billions of copies of itself. The exciting part uh, of the synthetic biology is that uh, a lot of new technologies have been developed over the last three decades in biotechnology. And people are viewing the genome of a cell, that's the ACs, Ts, and Gs, the DNA that makes the proteins, that makes it do what it does, uh, as an operating system for the cell. And synthetic biology is trying to turn that operating system into an engineering discipline. Evolution has done its best to optimize it for efficiency. It hasn't done its best for optimizing it for human readability. And it is not human readable, and it's extremely difficult to, uh, to write a genetic program that will do what you want it to do. However, there are some big technological advances that have happened in the last uh, five years, Craig Venter has um, really speeded up the sequencing of DNA. Now you could get your genome sequenced for a couple of thousand dollars at Complete Genomics here in Mountain View. Um, and recently, just uh, three years ago in Science, they published a paper on the complete synthesis of DNA. So not only can I read uh, a genome, but I can now write the genome. And if you uh, uh, looked at some of the news reports, when they wrote that complete genome, they added in some poetry, some email addresses, just to demonstrate their mastery of the, uh, of the genome. Um, we know what biology is capable for, if you, of. If you look at just a single seed uh, and the potential that it can grow into on Earth, imagine being able to send an engineered seed to the moon or Mars and have it grow into a habitat uh, of your own design. We are nowhere near understanding how a giant redwood uh, grows the way it does or what the genetic elements are responsible for that. But this new ability to rewrite genomes and rapidly screen for function is, a lot of people hope, going to allow us to one day uh, design giant structures and self-building habitats. 
where are we going to get these resources from? LCROSS um, or Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, um, a couple of years ago, the identification of huge amounts of water on the moon, not just in the craters, but on the entire surface of the moon, at least 600 million tons of water. And I know you heard from Jean Caravella yesterday on track with an energy and of course planetary resources and another um, other companies are also eyeing water as their first uh, target. If you look at what's inside that water, it's not or what's inside the lunar regolith ice that Elcross threw up, it's not just water. It is water 5.6% by mass. But also if you look down some of these lower percentages, uh, all of these are carbon containing molecules, ethylene, carbon dioxide, methanol, and methane. And if you look at what the main constituent of biological organisms is on Earth, which form the structural components or form the energy carrying molecules, they're carbon containing molecules. It's not a huge amount, but it's 0.4% uh, carbon by mass. So here's a vision. We can send a robotic infrastructure to row the moon. We can extract resources, volatiles, using solar. Um, we can feed them into a bioreactor that could produce food through photosynthesis. We can store that on, uh, as a cash consumable for future human con uh, consumption. And we already have a planned mining infrastructure on the moon as well. Um, and of course, we can now beam up a signal of DNA to this DNA synthesizer and hot swap this technology here on the moon uh, for some new organism. Suddenly we don't want to produce a biofuel anymore, we want to produce a pharmaceutical. So we can rewrite the organism here on Earth, do the uh, research here, and then beam up the new organism and change the consumable that you're being produced. Um, so we worked through one of these examples of, of uh, the uh, lunar food production using spirulina, which is this organism you can buy in health food stores. It's a cyanobacterium. Uh, it's grown if you fly into the big airport on Big Island on Hawaii, the airport, you can see huge spirulina farms here, here on Earth. Um, and so you could take in all these inputs, either from the ISS or from the moon, depending where you're going, have a core bioreactor technology for photosynthesis. You could demonstrate it and test it on small satellites and nanoracks and you could produce an output which would be uh, probably something equivalent to a slim fast shake. I'm not proposing that it's something amazingly delicious yet, but again, if it's $10,000 a liter uh, and you want to get into space cheaply, then I don't think you'll be picky. But I hope that synthetic biology will allow us to increase the protein content, the taste, the texture of the food. Um, and we published this last year in, in the International Journal of Astrobiology with Mike Montague from the uh, J. Craig Venter Institute showing that on a four-day batch, you could produce enough food for a human, um, in a, which is 682 grams per person per day. Um, this is highlighting how, if you look at the work that Jim's talking about, Jim Caravello at Shackleton, they're talking about these uh, um, orbital depots for, for water, hydrogen, oxygen. Maybe we can add food to that, attach our bioreactor to this existing planned infrastructure. So planned infrastructure is not existing. Uh, and they, they maybe as the dragon is, uh, is launched from Earth, it can just stop by and, uh, and fuel up on food as it's going to its destination. Um, here's a poster outlining all the potential applications. Uh, not all of them, but, but a good range of them. And there's a bunch of these posters on the table just outside if anyone's interested. Um, and then things that I'm not doing at NASA, which are also uh, pretty exciting in this area, there's a conference which uh, Sean came to last year, uh, the Synthetic Biology Startup Ecosystem. We're running it again in Mission Bay up in the city in November. And uh, the number of synthetic biology companies has quadrupled just in the last two years. So it's really uh, exponentially increased in the number of uh, companies getting involved in this area. And I hope we're gonna have a very prolific industry here on Earth that's gonna then be able to supply us future resources in space. And then the second thing that people here may be interested in is synb.org. It's a course that we are running up in San Francisco on June the 8th, later this summer, Synthetic Biology for Computer Programmers. So if there's anything here that interests you and you want to learn more about it, then we've designed this course to teach uh, biotech to tech people. And uh, that's it. Thank you all very much.
Thank you very much. We have time for maybe a couple of quick questions. Yes, right there. We know a lot about the <coughs> rocket technology than the simple living organism system. Uh, it's not easy to just synthesize a uh, random sequence of DNA and make it a viable uh, organism. So today's technology is pretty much using whatever exists existing life form, blueprint, and modify it. Uh, what do you think, uh, uh, Le Le Leroy Good is the initiator of the system biology, mm -hmm. and I hope that we could learn a lot more about the uh, biology system uh, through conversion to a uh, computing system. Right. What do you think, uh, there is, I know it's very controversial, what do you think of the system biology impact on the things like synthesizing life forms uh, outside of our planet. So, so I think the difference between systems biology and synthetic biology, systems biology is top down. They take a biological system and they probe it and they ask scientific questions and they try to understand how it works. Synthetic biology is bottom up, where they try and uh, make a system do something and from the failure or success of, of the actions that you get it to do, you understand and you reiterate the design. But that's a simple task, like just making a certain protein, mm. not the uh, uh, functioning of a whole biological system, because it's very complex. So I think it's they'll- It's one cell uh, system. I think they'll work together. So I think you're gonna have scientific input into the engineering process as you've had throughout history. A lot of science starts off as basic research and then is picked up by engineers and standardized and uh, and taken into a standardized workflow so that people can engineer it. And I think you're going to see the same. You're going to see a lot of input from basic science coming into synthetic biology. And you're going to see a lot of engineers coming in and saying, why can't we engineer a system uh, like I might engineer a circuit board? And the two at some point will converge and we'll stop calling them systems biology and we'll stop calling them synthetic biology and we'll just call it biology again. But this time we'll be able to engineer it. I remember I attended the first nanotechnology uh, workshop more than a decade ago. There's a lot of talk of uh, molecular assembly, uh, but that's like going down nowhere. But that's now starting to work. A lot, a lot of the, you know, a lot of the nanotechnology. I think there's a lot of hype, and it was maybe ten years too soon. But now there's a lot of examples of, of that function. Nanotechnology is starting to prove itself, just as people are stopping to talk about it. But not self-assembly. Anything closer. Than that. Is there one more question? Yeah, that way. Okay. Well, there it is. Great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I was wondering if you were aware of uh, down at the uh, Autodesk exhibits down in San Francisco, there's this effort that, uh, of experiments to, to grow an airbus, uh, grow an airplane. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, I know Carlos Ogwin very well, who, who heads the BioNano Programmable Matter Group at Autodesk. And uh, no, I didn't know about this project. I think it's fantastic. Uh, and um, yeah, I, I think um, it's, 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 it's a dream and it's very far off, but I think we need to do a bit more dreaming because uh, uh, the, certainly the bioscience can be, can be so conservative um, sometimes. And, and just, I guess, as a plug, you probably also, I, I don't know whether you did or not, in, in Symbio, we've all seen the, uh, the uh, Glowing Plants project, which was launched on Kickstarter last week, and they had a target of 65K for transfecting some, uh, some uh, luciferase genes into a rhabdopsis, into a plant, and they want to make a plant that will grow and be a tree, tree light. And everyone's like, that's a crazy idea. Uh, but it might just work, and, and the, the fundamentals are pretty good of it working. Anyway, they're up to about, 3,000 backers and 210,000 the last time I looked. So I'm really pleased that that project got off the ground. It's a ballsy project, um, but I think, I think in general, the bioscience is a bit too conservative and we need some, uh, some crowdfunding to take some riskier approaches with some of these ideas. And that's another one, the building the airliner. Thank you very much. Fascinating presentations.